how uh, what steps should be taken uh, to ensure ethical and responsible AI development? Excellent question. And 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 again, another area where as a world community, we're thrashing, we're all over the place. Everybody has a hand in it. July 1957, Einstein, Oppenheimer, and all the physicists got together in a small town called Pugwash in Nova Scotia. And they said, hey, let's take a break. We just invented this amazing thing that could annihilate the planet. What should we do? We need the AI scientists the AI ethicists and all the people who understand how and where this technology will go to get together and have a pugwash moment. Welcome to American Dreams. Today, my guest is Fadi Chahadi. Fadi, welcome to today's show. Thank you. Happy to be here. I'm certainly honored to have you as a guest on our show. And uh, and uh, for the listeners, Fadi, can you give uh, background of your your life path, how you got to where you are today. Um, I am. Uh, my parents hail from uh, Egypt. Uh, they are. Uh, they both left Egypt way before I was born, and lived in Ethiopia. My father was uh, a counselor to Haile Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia, for many years, and then they moved to Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon in the 50s and 60s was, quote unquote, the Paris of the Middle East. It was a beautiful place. I was born there and grew up in Lebanon. Uh, I, my first language was French. My second language was Arabic. And then my third language was Italian. And at 17, as the war raged in Lebanon, I was shipped over to the country of opportunity, to Los Angeles. I did not speak a lick of English. I landed in LAX. And uh, I lived in the basement of our church. I was the custodian of the church for a while, while learning English and studying philosophy. Uh, and then at a community college here in Los Angeles. Uh, and then my professor told me, son, if you want to feed your family, I think philosophy may not be the right path. You're good at logic. There's this new thing we just invented in America called the computer. Why don't you go study programming? Your English is terrible. So you can hide behind the computer and do some programming. And so I studied computer science. Um, got a scholarship at NYU, uh, which was then called Polytechnic University in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and uh, from there, I went to work for Bell Labs, this uh, amazing American institution where everybody had short sleeve shirts and a, a brain larger than uh, most of the world. And I learned a lot from my colleagues they sent me to Stanford to study this new thing called AI. Uh, and I went to the person who invented the word AI. John McCarthy was my professor. And I learned from him. And he also told me that if I wanted to feed my family, I should forget this thing called AI. There is this new thing called the internet. Why don't you go work on this new thing called the internet? And so I did. And I built three internet companies. I sold the first one to the Ingram family, the second one to IBM, and the third one in 2017 to Oracle. Uh, and uh, here I am. Uh, in between all these things, I got a call uh, from uh, our friends in, the, in Washington saying that uh, Edward Snowden had revealed a few things, and you and I will talk about this later, that placed me at the head of an institution called ICANN, um, and we'll talk about that. So I did that as well, along with a few other things. But today I am the founder and the managing partner of a private equity company called Ethos Capital, based in Boston. Uh, and I'm having a, a very good time doing that as well. What a remarkable journey. Uh, uh, you know, immigrants uh, coming over from a war-torn country into this country, uh, it it's uh, it, and then to be able to adjust as technology evolved and stay with the flowing river and to uh, be a major contributor. I want to jump forward though to um, this internet governance and 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 what led you into getting involved with ICAM. Excellent question because frankly this was a departure from my path. You said it's an amazing journey. But Alan, you know that this journey is a number of things. 
I say, my wife is a gardener, so I always say, I ask her, why did this plant do so well here and it didn't do so well there? And she always says, it's the soil. It's the soil. It's not the plant. And I was just lucky that my soil was this great country of opportunities. So when the call came to lead ICANN, my two boys, my wife and I sat around the dinner table and I said, that would be a big departure from my career, building software companies. Why should I do that? And we all agreed it was time to give back to the soil. It was my turn to also be responsible for the soil that helped me be who I am here today. So you asked me why I got into internet governance. I felt it's my duty as a naturalized American to give back to my country. And I couldn't say no when my country, which invented the internet, was under pressure because of Edward Snowden's revelations to, late, to, to change the way the internet was governed. And so I got involved in that. And the second reason I got involved in that, to answer your question, is I, I come from a war-torn country. I come from also a background of a minority in Egypt. I've seen what divisions in society do. And therefore, I am very attracted to things that unite rather than things that divide. And the internet is one of the few tools man built, despite the fact it causes also some divisions, but at its essence, it's something that unites people, unites humanity. I was very attracted to improve its governance so that it does not get fragmented. And the time, and we can talk more if you wish about that, at the time I agreed to run ICANN and get into internet governance, the prospect of a broken infrastructure of the internet was actually quite real. Uh, and in fact, I saw it with my own eyes when I traveled to China. There were preparations to break the root of the internet and to create multiple core internets. ICANN stands for what? What's the acronym A, represent? The Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. That's a mouthful. Names and Numbers. What makes the almost 78,000 networks that comprise the Internet look like the Internet is the fact that we have names and numbers, we call them the critical resources of the internet, that unite the internet as one network. And so the, the, when you type www.ibm.com on any device, on any computer in the planet, you always go to the one machine in Armonk, New York, probably, for IBM. How does this work? Because I can exists because we have one commitment from the whole world to maintain a set of numbers and names that make all the internet function like one network. And my responsibility was to make sure that those names and numbers remained global and available to everybody in an equitable way, governed properly by governments, businesses, civil society, and most importantly, the technical community that built the internet. In 2012, you became the head of ICANN. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and what are some of the things as you led the organization that, that uh, evolved into your, your leadership? Three things. The first, up until I was at ICANN, there were only a handful, a couple of dozen top-level domains. A top-level domain is what's after the dot. Dot com is a top-level domain. Dot info is a top-level domain. When I arrived, ICANN had a couple of dozen of these. And therefore, if you wanted dot Allen, it would not have been possible because it didn't exist. You could have Allen.com, uh, but not uh, any anything after the dot. Uh, I led the efforts to open up that and today we have 1,500 top-level domains. And not only in ASCII, let's say, English or Western characters, you can now have them in Chinese characters, in Cyrillic characters, 
in Arabic characters. So we grew and internationalized the domain name space so that there is enough room for everybody and it's not always restricted to .com. That's the first accomplishment we did. And it wasn't simple. It was very complicated. The second thing we did is we changed the governance of ICANN to become accepted by all the players in the world, governments, businesses, civil society, and technical communities, to ensure that the internet does not get fragmented. That was the majority of my effort. I had to work with the, the leaders of Brazil. I worked closely with Dilma Rousseff at the time, with Angela Merkel, with uh, Premier Li in China, to make sure that we have a governance model that kept everyone at the table rather than make them go away and say, I'm going to create my own internet, my own names, my own numbers, and separate from the rest of the world. And that succeeded. And the third thing I did when I took over ICANN, it was under 100 people, frankly, mostly based in the U.S. and friendly countries. And as part of dealing with the backlash from Snowden, we needed to make ICANN look like the world, frankly, look like the internet. And therefore, by the time I left, ICANN had close to 500 people in 35 countries representing the world and bringing the perspectives of the world on how the internet is governed to the heart of ICANN. Uh, you became involved with uh, the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation. Why is that important to have that cooperation on a global scale as, and how, it, how does that impact the uh, internet governance? You know, Alan, there are very few resources that I would call transnational. The internet is a transnational resource. IP numbers typically don't know what country they're in. So when the internet runs, it runs above the nation state model and the infrastructure we built legally and from a policy standpoint there. So the internet, like almost the climate, is a transnational resource that the world shares. Maintaining it this way was important. And therefore, when the internet suddenly became central to the geopolitical dialogue, after the Snowden events, everybody wanted to get their hands on how it is governed. And frankly, that was a moment that was dangerous. The last thing we need is for everybody to strangle the innovation that the internet brings and to overload it with governance and with rules that would take away the value it brings. That doesn't mean it, we shouldn't have guardrails, but how this is done was important. And at the time, uh, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General, invited me first to speak to all the heads of the UN agencies at their annual retreat in New York. So I went and I met with the heads of all the UN agencies, 50 of them, in a, in a private meeting. And of course, the, the message at the time was, how can we get involved to control the internet? How can we get involved to make it safer? All well-intentioned, but frankly, needed to be measured. So my job through this, and I invited the Secretary General to form this digital cooperation panel, which included at the time Jack Ma and Melinda Gates and Vint Cerf and many key players, was to frankly make sure that we are measured in how we govern this resource and that governments do not feel that the internet must be governed top down, but rather should be governed bottom up by involving all the stakeholders and allowing it to be much more polycentric in its governance rather than top-down. And we succeeded in doing that out of this panel. Let's move the page over to uh, Ethos, Ethos Capital, a uh, private equity fund that you're a founder and managing partner of. What are your primary focus uh, in, in this fund, and how do you align with current trends in the digital economy? My primary focus is to help and enable companies in the broad economy to employ the digital tools that are available to them to serve their customers better, to operate more efficiently, and to reach new heights they couldn't do with the new technologies. 
And so I am essentially a fund helping companies in plain old analog industries, in insurance, in financial services, in supply chain, and logistics, to actually leverage the latest technologies in order to digitize their operations and to gain advantages in their markets and, uh, frankly, uh, uh, to improve what they deliver to their customers. So digital transformation, that's the business I'm in. Uh, I do not buy tech companies despite my deep technology background. I use technology as a tool to help companies become better. So ethos is a little counterintuitive on how most you private equity firms, um, how did you come up with that name? <laughs> it, it is indeed uh, a bit uh, counterintuitive. In fact, we met with a professor at Berkeley who runs the Center for Technology and Ethics and shared with her our plan. And then she said, what are you going to name this new investment PE company? And we said, Ethos Capital. And once she stopped laughing, she told us, we're not. We're going to have a huge uh, bullseye on our back. To call the PE firm Ethos uh, is counterintuitive, as you just noted out. And we, Eric and I, the founders of Ethos, looked at each other and we told her precisely, that's exactly what we want to do. Now, he had been in private equity for decades. I was new to private equity. And I think you're right, Alan. Um, our industry has not always acted in a way that is aligned with the term ethos, which means character. Uh, but character is all that matters. Uh, how we do things is all that matters. So at Ethos, we're trying to do things uh, leading with our character. Uh, what does that mean? It, it's simple. I'm a Boy Scout, so I know that I'm going to leave a place better than I found it. So we're also going to do the same. We're going to buy companies and make sure that we always leave them better than when we found them. Not worse, not cut to the bone, not uh, shaped in ways that just make it look good on a spreadsheet, but rather a better company, a company that serves its communities better. And frankly, this is not some kind of a, a soft goal. No, we actually believe when companies behave in this way and uh, uh, manage themselves with, with ethics and character up front, they actually turn out to be better companies. They serve their customers better. Their suppliers bend, bend backwards to, to support them. Their environment is better. Their communities respect them and want to do business with them. So this is not some kind of a soft impact goal. No, this is a practical goal. And frankly, we have a lot already to show that it does work. It does work. I like to move into cybersecurity, uh, the emerging trends that you see, and how can organizations better prepare for the challenges surrounding uh, this age of digital transformation and keeping our data secure? Cybersecurity is one of the only places where you'll find me a little bit dark. Uh, I am genuinely worried. Uh, I'm worried because uh, artificial intelligence and the capabilities of generative AI uh, are going to be used by the good guys and the bad guys. The question is who will prevail. Uh, the bad guys will use artificial intelligence to fuel uh, their threats, their attacks uh, in ways that we still don't know and we still don't understand. Uh, and I have, uh, I have seen enough of uh, the dark side of the digital world to know that there are genuinely people uh, plotting right now to how to leverage AI to not just amplify the, what we call the attack surface, uh, but to also uh, render it far more sophisticated. Because remember, the way we uh, uh, manage threats and we prevent threats is uh, uh, mostly through pattern recognition. It's just watching the patterns, seeing the patterns, and then we block uh, the attacks as a result. 
Now, if those patterns change at the speed of AI, and if they come at us at the speed of AI, the only way we're going to be able to really withstand them is with AI itself. And so the good guys and the bad guys are in a race right now. They've always been in a race in cyber, but that race is now amplified by orders of magnitude with uh, artificial intelligence. So I am, uh, frankly, uh, in fact, this morning, I spent most of my morning uh, uh, in discussions to acquire uh, an AI cyber company because I do believe there is both a responsibility as well as an importance uh, to focus in that area right now, to invest in that area, to enable companies that are going to really be good at leveraging AI um, in that space. Yeah, you mentioned, uh, you know, it, 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 you're looking at an acquisition of a cybersecurity company with AI. Um, as you look at Ethos in general as a private equity firm, are you primarily just concentrated on cybersecurity companies? No. No, we will be, even in that cybersecurity company, frankly, it's less of a, it, it uses AI, but it's more of a business to business services company. As I said, I am, I'm trying not to invest in pure tech. I'm trying to invest in services, especially B2B services, whether it's in insurance, financial services, security, et cetera, uh, but that can be fueled and enabled by AI, blockchain, uh, sensorization, modern IoT, all the things that are emerging that can enable companies to really operate at a brand new level. And frankly, AI uh, is, I mean, I'm super excited about artificial intelligence first because I, I, am, I, I as much as I can, I understand it, I've used it, I've studied it, uh, but I also do believe it's a for, it can be a force for good if it's in the right hands. And it's also an important technology that will help me at Ethos, but will hopefully help our economy and the good guys in the economy uh, to build great companies and great industries that we can't even imagine today yet. Uh, and I do think that AI will enable both Web3, Web4, and Web5. You know, we are living in the Web3 space now with, you know, the... the uh, the, the, the blockchain and all the technologies that this brought. But now Web4 is going to be really about uh, trust and about one-to-one -one, uh, and the hyper-personalization of content. Uh, all of this, I think, will lead to new industries and new possibilities that I'm frankly quite excited about. You know, Fadi, your concern with AI is, is a common concern as I had opportunity to discuss with... Uh, digital leaders in in the field of AI. Uh, I, I got to ask a question, since you're involved in internet governance, how uh, what steps should be taken uh, to ensure ethical and responsible AI development? Excellent question. And, 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 and again, another area where, as a world community, we're thrashing. We're all over the place. Everybody has a hand in it. California just, you know... Uh, finished the law that is sent to Governor Newsom to see if he'll sign it. And uh, uh, Congress already informed him that they don't like it. And then you go globally and there's all kinds of uh, focus on that. Let me tell you where I think it ought to start. July 1957, Einstein, Oppenheimer, and all the physicists got together in a small town called Pugwash in Nova Scotia. And they said, hey, let's take a break. We just invented this amazing thing that could annihilate the planet. What should we do? What are the guardrails? And they spent multiple days together coming up, and they understand the technology. They came up with a framework that ended up being exactly what the non-proliferation treaties adopted years later. Same thing happened in 87 about the DNA here in Asilomar in California, where all the scientists around genetics came together and created a framework that is today the NIH framework for making sure genetics remains safe. The internet had the same experience in the late 90s with Vint Cerf and Steve Crocker and the White House agreeing to create ICANN and all these institutions to make sure the internet remains open but safe. Today, 
We need the AI scientists, the AI ethicists, and all the people who understand how and where this technology will go to get together and have a pugwash moment where they can start building these frameworks and these guardrails. So if we do them this way, rather than with all due respect, by starting in legislatures, the legislature should come later after the scientists and the engineers came up with the framework, then the legislators are good to enforce these frameworks, to make them treaties, to make them things that people can live by, companies, businesses, and governments. So I think we're doing it a little bit backwards because we're in a rush, but I'm hoping that there will be a moment of reflection to really bring it back to the people who created these technologies in the first place. Fadi, it's been a pleasure having you with us today. I, I got one last question here. Uh, at, at the end of the day, Fadi, how do you want to be remembered with all these uh, career accomplishments and things that you're working on? How would you like to be remembered as your legacy? I would love it if people would look back at my trajectory, my path, and not just see me, but see all what enabled me because we often focus on the person. And yes, of course, I have worked hard and continue to work hard. But what made this possible is much more than me. Uh, when I mentioned to you earlier that soil, what was in that soil? What were the nutrients? Who were the other people? What was this system in this country of ours that enables someone like me, the son of immigrants who arrived alone and worked at cleaning a church for the first six months of arriving to this country, be able to achieve this. This is not just me. This is the environment we're in. So let us just keep focusing on the ecosystem uh, and the things that enable people like me, because I'm hoping that the next thousand people who arrive to our great country uh, get to leverage that soil and achieve great things, just like I had the opportunity. That's my Thank you. Absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you for being with us today here on American Dreams.